Welcome to today's Mughal session. My name is Pierce Handing, Director and CEO of TIFF. It really gives me enormous pleasure to introduce a very, very close dear friend of mine, as well as somebody who I have immense respect for. Jeremy Thomas is one of the great producers, one of the probably last standing true independent producers. He's had an incredible track record of films, well over 50 films. He's won an Oscar for um, Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor. He's produced many of Bernardo's films. Um, worked very closely with our own David Cronenberg, produced so many Kiki films over the years. Has also worked very closely with Asian directors, Nikisa Ashima, Takashi Miike, um, produced Skolomowski. It's a very eclectic taste, goes back to the early days of uh, Nick Rogue, a filmmaker who I had great, great affection with. Um, he has won so many awards for his films, he has immaculate taste. He really, really fights hard for what he believes in, completely. Um, and I have, uh, as I said, I think he's one of the most uh, independently minded uh, producers who is deeply involved in the creative process with his filmmakers and creates a, a wonderful space for them. So we're absolutely delighted to have him here as a part of our mogul session. Jeremy, thank you for doing this. Now let me introduce our moderator, Jacqueline uh, Lianga. Jacqueline has worked in film production and distribution for our own Triptych Media, October Films, and Polygram Filmed Entertainment. She's also developed projects for film and TV for the CBC, Bat Pictures, Disney Lifetime, Urban Entertainment, and the Robbie Theatre Company. Holds a BA in Cinema Studies and Art History from the University of Toronto, and an MFA from the American Film Institute, where she is currently the director of the AFI Fest. Welcome, Jacqueline, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Piers. So um, first, I, I, I really want to start at the beginning um, with this conversation. You're, you grew up as the son of a director. Um, can you talk about, tell us about that experience and that, how that informed who you are as a creative producer? Well, you know, I was a victim of cinema from my first um, visuals and thoughts because I was born within spitting distance of Ealing Studios where my father was working in the late 40s. And um, I grew up in Gerrard's Cross where my father became successful, bought a house close to Pinewood, cycling distance for a boy from Pinewood. And I was given, my father was a very successful film director, in fact, probably the most successful film director of movies in England in the 50s and early 60s. And because of his position, I was given privileges that other boys weren't given, and um, my sister too. And we were allowed free access to Pinewood Studios. And we played on the set of Cleopatra and Titanic and you know, watched things that nobody should watch. Plus, later in the day, when we were at home, which was very close to Pinewood, all the crew of my dad's crew, which included people like Hope Hethber, Hepburn, Brigitte Bardot, Dirk Bogart was my godfather, what can I tell you? I was a lucky boy, and um, I took it with both hands later. And I knew, unlike most people, from like the age of 12, what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I wanted to be a train driver like my dad, you know. <laughs> with all of this experience then, and this, this world of cinema that you were immersed in, then what was your first job, real job in, in film? Well, I left school when I was 17 with no exams. I mean, I had three exams which you meant have five to get to any further education. So I was a very hopeless school student. I hated school, and I was a very uh, recalcitrant child um, for learning. I didn't want to learn. I wanted to watch movies, and uh, there's sort of a melange of movies in my head um, that I was shown. My father used to bring 16 mil movies home to show us, and um, so I, I knew what exactly. And I got a, to get into the cinema in Britain in the uh, late 60s, you had to be a member of the union. It was a very, very strong union. It was a closed shop. And so I had to go into the lowliest job, which was in the dark room at, Pinewood, at Rank Laboratories in Denham. And I went into the, I uh, was uh, doing sort of work from four in the afternoon to four at night when the rushes came in. And um, it was close to where I lived. I hadn't left home yet. And uh, that was my first job, which was nearly a year. A terrible chemical smell. It was horrible. And... Um, yeah, it was very hard to breathe in there. It was dark, and you wear rubber boots and gloves and really stinking chemicals, and it was horrible. But that was a year, and then I got um, freedom. I got my union card, and then I could go out to a place which was full of employment. Film in Britain in the late 60s 
there were like six or seven studios around London all looking for people to work and um, first of all I was like a post boy runner then I got a gig working on a film directed by Roddy McDowell I was in as a third assistant editor doing numbering of rushes and I got my break in it and um, I worked on this film. I was befriended in um, Ava Gardner. I thought I was a really sweet boy. And uh, I was the one who had to show her rushes at lunchtime with the corgis and all that. And um, it was a big experience and I continued. And then, you know, the people that I met, you meet on the river of life in the cinema, uh, people who um, you work with. And, you know, it's uh, very important who you meet next and how you, how you continue. And I was lucky because I just went from film to film to film until I ended up with Ken Loach as an assistant to Ken Loach and um, I worked from second assistant and first assistant and one day he said to me would you edit my film so that was um, worked on Harder They Come I worked on with Ray Harry I was on a similar Golden Voyage I saw Dynamation being done it was I was pre-digital pre-Steambeck <laughs> there was a world pre-Steambeck can you believe that <laughs> and the flatbed was a revelation there was a the editor used to edit the film and put paper clips in it. There wasn't even a tape joiner. And then me, my job, I had to wet, do the cuts on the 35 mil, make sure I kept the trim, even one frame in a tin. You'd get fired if you didn't have the one, tr one frame. And uh, it was a very different job. But it was labor intensive and there were like 20 people on each movie, 20 boys doing this stuff. And then how did you make the transition from being an editor to becoming a producer? I edited a film called Brother King's Paradigm for a director called Philippe Mora, who was a sort of tri child prodigy artist and filmmaker. He made a film called Swastika, which was a very famous film, and a compilation of documentaries. And this film was about America in the 30s, of um, 29, uh, great, the crash, um, until the Pearl Harbor. And it was set about, and Rosa, it was when um, film archives were uh, available to you, and we were paid to go and make this compilation film using all the films of James Cagney and all the speeches and works of FDR, Roosevelt, to integrate into the Super Brother King this paradigm. Anyways, it was a big success. Critical success went to Cannes in the main selection. And I watched all that as the editor, because the editor was like, it was not a normal film because it was an editing job and a directing job. And then that director said, let's go to Australia. I've got a book. And um, we can go to Australia and I think we can find the money to make a film. So I went there to edit and produce this film. And I never, I never got to um, edit the film because it was a uh, star Dennis Hopper, which needed full-time wrangling, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it was a baptism of fire, I can tell you. But <laughs> to digress quickly to a very quick little anecdote, um, I went to Australia, like it was like going on a, being a hundred years before, going as a sort of privileged, landed gentry sent to Australia with a letter to the governor, look after this person. The rank organization who my father worked for had a tie-up with a company in Australia called Greater Union Films, or British, British Empire Films, BEF, British Empire Films. I think there probably was one in Canada too. Anyway, <laughs> it was called BEF. And I took a handwritten letter from my father to the Sir Norman Ridge who owned this company. And my father had never been to Australia. So finally I got a letter back from him to come and meet me for lunch at my club. And I bought a suit and I went to lunch in this traditional club. And he said at the end of the meal, uh, what do you want, really? And he said, oh, I've got a letter from your father. And I said, I want to make a film in Australia about Daniel Morgan, who's a, a, a bush ranger. And he said, uh, I'll tell you what, you know, your father made me a fortune. I wanted to go and see the guy who runs my film company. And he'd ring him tomorrow. So I rang this guy tomorrow. He said, I have no idea what got into the old man. He wants you to give you $200,000 to your film, which is 50% of the budget. So that was the... Uh, that was the beginning of my entry into production, which was pretty easy. <laughs> wow, that's extraordinary. And, 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 you know, in terms of extraordinary, I, I would say your continued success is really extraordinary. And, and you know, there's no model, there's no um, set path that anyone can follow. How, how have you managed to continue to produce films for decades and remain successful? It's confusing to me, I have to say, because it's four decades and um, I love it still. Um, and I don't know what else I would do. I, I don't understand people who retire. I don't think you can retire from this business. So yeah, basically, I don't know what else I could do. So I'm just doing what my 
my job and my passion is. You know? So I've been, you know, I admit I've been very lucky, you know, and I am boring by saying how lucky I've been. But I've also been privileged to come into the cinema where taste was something which was crucial, you know. And I really, really follow my taste, you know, and I don't follow the market, and it sounds mad. But the market is fickle, but your taste is, can be sublime, you know. And uh, the market, if you follow the market, you're in, um, it's a very different route, route, route to go down and living in Europe and not working for a major conglomerate. I've been able to um, have that privilege to follow my taste and somehow I've managed to get somewhere close to the mark a lot of times. You know, success is relative. I wouldn't, I mean, I'm successful in um, managing to continue my work of a certain standard. Relative success uh, to um, uh, box office, you know, it's patchy, you know, to be truthful. <laughs> but um, every four or five years when I think, you know, I'm never going to get there with another movie, something happens and something's a hit. And, and I, then people, you can live. On a big hit, you can live uh, with a reputation maybe for a decade. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a director, one bad film and he's over, you know. And that's a terrible thing that happens to director, you know. They can have 50 hits and make one disaster and they're finished. It's a very, very, there's a lack of loyalty in this business. Um, and it wouldn't happen in any other art form. I mean, you, you wouldn't call Picasso a terrible painter if he did one bad painting. But a director makes one bad film and he's over, you know. And because he's lost money for people. And um, that's a strange element of our business, you know. Well, I, I think certainly starting Hanway um, had a, a great deal to do with your continued success. I mean, you were very successful with um, the recorded picture company and the films that you made there. Can you talk about why, why Hanway um, and at that time? Yeah. Well, my dad, I remember he had a couple of expressions he gave me. One, one was, um, you leave the film business or it leaves you, which is really true and um, and the other one is mutate or die you know so I'm in the mutate or die sort of guy so I'm mutating my business and uh, philosophizing continually to myself and anybody who listened to me and my staff who work with me they get punished often with my thinking out loud about what I'm going to do and uh, Hanway came because I needed to, to uh, change um, the way I was setting up films, the film business has changed dramatically since I started. Uh, it's, kind of, it's unrecognizable, really, uh, how the films are set up and how they're marketed, and it's changing as we speak. Annually, it changes the dominance of different markets. And um, to go back, you know, to the beginning, you know, the beginning, I was making films analog. There wasn't the fax. You were communicating by telex machine. There was mobile phones. Even the brick didn't even thought about that. So it was a totally different. And then you change. And the same for Forming Hanway, which is an international sales company, which started off because I'd been working with... Them. I had a very good partner. I've had lots of good partners. Not um, uh, partners in my business, as partners in doing things. And I had a good partner called Terry Glynwood, who, was a, who worked for Robert Stigwood as a salesman. And then he, well, I went to work with him in the first half dozen movies. He sold for me, and then we had an experience with Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, together. He helped me put that together. And then the runoff movies, and then one day he said, I'm retiring, you know. And that was a tragedy for me. And then I had a couple of movies with the French companies, Little Buddha, and then The Stealing Beauty. And then I thought, I don't like this. I can't work like this anymore. I've got to do it again. I've got to be in control of my destiny again. And so we started Hanway again to sell um, Bertolucci film Besiege. And then... Um, the Kitano from Brother, and um, those, the Brother was successful, strangely enough, and it, it gave us a stimulus, okay, we just won't be a little bit of a recorded picture company, we're going to make a really proper sales company, and um, what I do for myself, I'm sure that my colleagues all want to enter. So I changed the name from, record, from recorded sales to Hanway Pictures, because I'm in Hanway Street in London. And also the Han are a tribe of very, very brutal Chinese warriors. So um, I thought, well, you know, people are bullshit that, that it's called Han, the way of the Han Hanway. And, um, and so Hanway was born. And um, I've got a wonderful group of colleagues in there who are all love cinema. And at the moment, that is the route and the way that I'm looking at um, to help fund my, get my films made. 
You talked earlier about taste, and I think um, taste uh, is, is very important um, in, in it for every artist, and certainly for a producer. So can you tell us about some of your key cinematic influences, the, the filmmakers, the directors, and, and even you know, visual artists who've affected um, your choices? Well, you know, the film encompasses all the great art forms, you know, and I love music. And music is a part, daily part of my life. And I like watching music and listening to a whole right, a range of music I enjoy. And um, literature, less now. I'm not reading as much as I used to, but uh, my wife's a professor of English, and um, we talk about books a lot. I love paintings, passionately. I go to galleries all the time. I recently was in Detroit with Jim Jarmusch making a movie whilst he was sleeping because we were night shooting from about vampires. Um, I was in the Institute of Art in Detroit, with the most amazing museum I've ever been in my life, you know. I never seen anything like it, and I could just spend all day in there, you know. And the cinema was the same. You know. I got, um, I was shown cinema um, by my father, who was a, was a mainstream commercial filmmaker, and I saw all the sort of healing comedies and Hitchcock and and big epics like The Hawk Soldiers and um, Disney films, Lazy and the Tramp. Early, you know, typical kid stuff, uh, plus a little bit of um, quality fare. And then I got uh, infected by the National Film Theatre in London, which we had a programmer called Ken Blashen, passed. He worked at BAFI, he moved to LA. And he was the director of the first um, film festival, I think. He was, you know, a lovely guy. And he opened my mind to Asian cinema, Cedric Ray, Chris Owen, you know, Ozu Mitsuguchi. And um, suddenly I realized cinema was something completely different and poetic. And, um, and then I rediscovered British films and um, French films and all those beautiful moments, um, which are more hard to get now because cinemas are not shown in, they're not projected anymore. And you don't watch them in a darkened room. That's a Chinese name for cinema is Electric Shadows. We don't get Electric Shadows anymore. We watch on computers and alone probably alone or with one person in the room when it's a bad scene you can make a cup of tea it's a very different experience than only being able to watch cinema in film in a cinema with its projector light and that ambience and even maybe a bit of smoke in the air you can see the beam you know it's all very romantic but it was great and now it's very different you know so cinema is appreciated in another way maybe it's not the same it's not the same way and uh, you have to make a real effort to watch cinema of the past it's not easy I mean, it is easier in some respects with a smart TV and you can get the stuff. But it was different when you were watching a repertory cinema or the cinema subtitle films were the norm. I mean, there were... I was thinking of my... my, my uh, growing up in the film was... Um, international cinema was like it is. During the, during the Toronto Film Festival, international cinema lives. Uh, as soon as the festival was over, it tails off and those films aren't being watched again. And they're watched passionately during the festival but you know world cinema is a very um, difficult place to get um, a lot of people to see it and um, that's something that's happened and there's, there's my favorite films my influences of cinema that somebody today would have to be pushed to that and secondly in film schools worldwide the least popular um, subject is history of cinema people just want to create new not thinking that the past informs the present you know and that's a, that's an area I don't get. I don't. That's, I don't understand that. But that's the fact. Well, thinking, speaking of festivals, you were on the jury of the Cannes Film Festival in, in 1987, um, and I, I'd love to hear more about that experience. Um, you know, the discussions, the um, the pressures of being on a jury um, at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, were the decisions difficult? Was it a difficult time or easy? Um, was it enjoyable at all? Yeah, it's probably one of the highlights of my life, I have to say. Um, I love being on a jury um, when you're forced to see films you're never going to see. You know, four-hour, five-hour films. There were real ordeals that you had to go through on the jury. Um, but... Um, I had a jury of incredible people. The president was Yves Montand. Mm. I was 38 years old, which I was half the age of most of the people. There was Klimov, a great Russian director who was the most depressed man I've ever met in my life. Didn't speak a word of English. He had a translator behind him. There was Angelopoulos, who unfortunately got 
killed by a car as he was reversing his, with his Chewie looking for a shot. He got killed. This year, in the Oscars, when they announced the people who died, he wasn't even mentioned. That was Angelopoulos who made all those great movies. So we live in another world. You know, the Academy didn't recognize that Angelopoulos was worthy of uh, being put on the name of people who died in the year before, yet he made some of the greatest films ever made. You know, so those sort of things. Um, that's, sorry, that's still digressing. What was in the jury? Um, Yerji Skolomowski mm. and um, Piovani and who else? Anyway, there was an incredible jury. And Norman Mailer. Last but not least, Norman Mailer. Quite a punchy individual. <laughs> and he, um, he was very passionate about his choices. And um, when it came to make the uh, decision, it's like um, the conclave of our cardinals to choose a pope. You know? <laughs> You're whisked out of town in the, early in the morning on the Sunday, and you go to a villa, and you're locked in a room, and um, you really can't come out until you've made your decision. And um, there's no influence at all. But on the jury was Klimov, and in the competitors with Mikhalkov, who was another Russian director who was privileged in the eyes of Klimov. And there was a hell of a lot of fighting, I can tell you. And um, Norman Mellie didn't like that at all. He got very upset. And there was a lot of passion, high rising. And we just chose a film because it was the only film that everybody could agree was OK. It was so, <laughs> and it was a good film called um, uh, Under the Satan Sun, directed by Pila. And um, it was very controversial when it came. The uh, decision was called out. It was universal booing um, from th thousands of people. And uh, still the insults were coming to me as I flew home to London from the UK critics. Why do you choose that piece of shit? You know, that was, and um, so it was a controversial but enjoyable time. And I've done other, so many juries since then. And, uh, you know, it's an event. And uh, I, I, I remember it. I've got the photograph on my wall in my office in London with all the signatures of the... And I was like a groupie at that time. And I was... I mean, um, it's 30 years later nearly. Not 30, but 28. But I mean, a long time later. And I've now sort of matured myself into being sort of a figure of cinema. At that time, I was a guy who'd made you know, 10 interesting movies or 12 interesting movies. And uh, I was thrilled when I was asked to be on the jury. It was, um, I thought, wow, that's incredible. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And this was the time of The Last Emperor. Um, so, and, and that's a film that re in some ways um, really brought attention to your name on a, in, a more, in a broader way to uh, a North American audience. Um, you won the Oscar for Best Picture and, and worked with two you know, very kind of brilliant uh, um, creative talents, Bernardo Bertolucci, who you've worked with before, and um, cinematographer Vittorio Storaro. What was, what was it like working with them? And, and then how did... Um, you know, you had all of these accomplishments already, but then winning an Oscar, was that something that changed um, your choices afterwards? Well, it was, you know, of course, it's a life changer, an Oscar, and uh, it was unexpected. You know, we just made the film, and suddenly, you know, it was such an extraordinary thing that it was an undeniable presence in cinema. It wasn't universally liked, of course, and... Um, in fact, the initial reviews were really bad, you know. If you, if you looked at Variety Review, you'd say, this is a no-hoper. Um, seriously. And the lead, the lead critic in London, Alexander Walker, excoriated the film at the beginning, and we thought we were dead, you know. And uh, suddenly this thing walked on its own two legs out into the Oscars. <laughs> there was no um, videotapes and parties and backhanders, canapes, big canapes. And, <laughs> champagne and, and you know look at our script money wasn't involved it was just the sheer the matter of 10,000 dressed Chinese people and that extraordinary story of from emperor to citizen you know son of heaven lord of 10,000 years who died as a gardener so that was an incredible story to tell and um, in fact Bertolucci called me I knew his brother-in-law very well Mark Peplo the writer of The Passenger and uh, he said, um, you made this film in Asia with Oshima. I want to make a film in China. Where can we meet? And I chose the local restaurant, Li Ho Fook. Let's have a lunch in Li Ho Fook. He said, great. And he arrived. He did two tones with him. And he said, I've got this book I want to make into a film, which is from, called From Emperor, Emperor to Citizen. 
and um, as I was, you know, Bertolucci, sort of not worthy type of thing. And he, he um, said, would you do it? And of course, I immediately said, of course, how could I say anything else? Yes, but I didn't realize how difficult the whole thing was going to be, which was an extraordinarily difficult process. And um, that film changed sort of my idea of what film can be in cinema and Bertolucci bravery, Bertolucci to go and shoot with those many people. Can you imagine coming out of a caravan in front of you with light, a short light day, because we had to dress 10,000 people. I had to start dressing them at two o'clock in the morning to get them ready for 10 o'clock on the set. And then they had to be drilled and shoot. And we could only shoot for a day. We couldn't afford more than that. And then for a director to come and shoot all that scenes, all the scenes with, I don't know if you, you've probably all seen the film, the scenes on the dice with the little baby who could, and getting it all right to actually count the car cowing at the right moment, these incredible camera moves that Bertolucci does. You know, that was brave, you know, that was really like going to war for a general, you know, it was the comparison of the pressures on him, and he was very cool. And I was um, lucky to work with him, and I continued working with him on, um, on um, many films. It was, you know, working with a man like that is a gift, because uh, he's a lovely guy. And um, he's somebody who's overseeing a party whilst he's shooting. I mean, the dancing scenes from 1900, it was like lunchtime on his set, you know. We'd have incredible lunches every day, wine, and he'd be, <laughs> even in China, pasta chefs came. Uh, we had two or three days of Chinese food and then the Italian crew went on a strike. <laughs> because the noodles, the wrong sort of noodles. And there was um, continual fighting about who brought the noodles to who, whether Marco Polo brought it or vice versa. But anyway, we had to bring out lots of pasta and pomodoro and espresso crew. It, it's very important for Italians, uh, the carbohydrate intake at lunchtime. <laughs> That's what I learned on that film. So how, how early on are you involved in, in crafting the script? You've, you've done another number of adaptations from literature, biographies. Do you get involved before there's a first draft at the outline stage, or do you start to get involved um, after there's a draft of, of a screenplay? It's different on different projects. You know, I'm involved. I mean, I dream what the film is going to be when I think of what the film is going to be, and then there's a sort of the way that you have to take in pragmatic uh, pragmatism comes into something and uh, also experience comes into films um, I mean I used the Contiki but we haven't got the Contiki, it's a bit later but the Contiki is a recent a film that changed shape so much over the sort of 16 years I was involved in that passion idea I want to put this story on the film I think people can love this film and it changed, I had to change the idea and um, but I was sort of, I had a sort of um, a feeling, an overview feeling of what the film could be all the way throughout its life and uh, had a sort of an affection for it and try to involve myself as much as I could. Different films and the geography of the films and how you're dealing with and the language of the film. Like with Mike, making for the Mike, he didn't speak no English. So I have to communicate him with the translator. Whereas Oshima spoke English earlier. I made this film with Oshima. I made two films with Oshima actually. And uh, he spoke very good English, so that was able to communicate with him like that. And in fact, communicating through a translator is quite um, efficient because you are much more focused on what you're saying. And so I've um, had those sort of uh, relationships with people as well. It's hard to say it's all different, but an adaptation of a book is, um, can be great, it can be very difficult. The Sheltering Sky was a very difficult book to adapt, for example, as The Naked Lunch was very difficult to adapt. Mm -hmm. Um, and Crash was very difficult to adapt. <laughs> and I tell you, they're, you know, they're like... Um, it's nice to take a book and the, the germ of an idea in there that you like what the subject is underneath the subtext. And then you think, how am I going to get this thing adapted into a... Um, I mean, I, I read Naked Lunch when I was young. Duh. And, um, <laughs> and I met David Cronenberg in 1980 at the... Labatt's, Labatt's party for Best Film, which bad timing won the audience award. And I met David in a bar, and he said to me, I want to do Naked Lunch, and I had a flash of light. You're the only director in the world who could do it. 
I don't know any other director who I would go into this journey with. And I went and got the book from uh, William Burroughs for 500 bucks a year. And I kept that book for seven years, and then David said, I'm ready to write the script. But he needed some sort of inspiration. I kept on pestering him every year. When's the script? When are you going to write the script? You know? And um, <clears throat> every year I'd option, re the book. In fact, the option went up to $1,000 a year oh. after five years. <laughs> and I just kept on it. And um, that was seven or eight years. And I stick with projects for decades. I mean, I can stick with a project for 10 years. But I've been talking with the director today. I had lunch with the director today, and I wanted to make a film. And he said, I'm busy for five years. I said, I don't care. I'll spend the money now. I'll wait. And so I'll wait for that. And I'll put money down now. Not a lot of money. Enough money to secure the idea. And then I'll, I'll let it mature on the barrel. And um, when the director's ready to make that film, if I feel he's genuine when he wants to do it, then it'll be better than forcing it through. And um, then um, original screenplays, just about just made an original screenplay with Jim Jarmusch. About to start a new screenplay, original screenplay, in a few weeks' time. That's more unusual. Sexy Beast, that was an original screenplay. Um, it's just taste, you know, read it, like it. That's what I do. You know, that's what I've been lucky to do. And uh, I look through my filmography now, and I don't know how I did it. I really don't. I look at it, how the hell did I do that? Because it's like, you know, there's so many films, so many experiences which roll into each other making sometimes, I used to make one film a year, and then I make two films a year, and then I make three films a year. Sometimes there's no films, sometimes there's three films, you know. And um, Pina, no idea that was going to be, what, love Pina Bausch? Got to do, oh yeah, film vendors and Pina Bausch, yeah. I want to see it. So of course I supported that, persuaded film, go for it, go for it, go for it. Even after Pina died, I, I kept on saying, must, we must, you must do it, you must do it. Everyone wants, you want, you know, Pina Bausch going to go, disappear from the world, the people who dance to her. And, and um, I didn't know that film would be successful. Who would think that film would be successful? The last film you think would be successful. <laughs> and uh, that was very successful. So it's, you can't really tell, but it, it was only driven by, I want to see that. Yeah, that was a really an extraordinary film. And, and the use of 3D in Pina just... It was a special use of 3D. Yeah. And we did another 3D film with Mike, mm -hmm. And that was less unique. I mean, it was the same technique, but it was a different, with different film somehow used it in that you could really, he was like, suddenly the paintbrush got thick, yeah. you know, the paint went on in a thick way, and suddenly it was there in 3D for you, and uh, it was a really special film, yeah. and uh, you know, it's the last film you think people would go and see in uh, tens of thousands. But they did. Mm -hmm. And um, and so now, in terms of sp you know special films, um, you have a film here, um, Contiki, um, which I saw last night. And I have to say, as I was saying to you earlier, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, and you're a fan of Jaws, I think um, Contiki takes um, Man versus Shark to a new level. There's some really extraordinary um, scenes in that film. Can you talk about about shooting those scenes, um, where they were shot, and and, and the kind of um, effects that were used to create the sharks? Well, I can't talk 100% technically on it, but I can say that I was very lucky the way that this film worked, the Conti, because it was a long journey, and I originally thought I was going to make it as a Hollywood-style movie, because this was before digital technology, 1996, you could have made water like this, all sharks like this, and if you look at the sharks in Jaw, they're very primitive, you know, they're virtually unwatchable, because when that animal looks up, it looks like a complete fake, you know, and things have progressed, plus... I work with very, very gifted directors. In fact, one of them was in this room here. Yeah. And uh, I was very lucky, uh, Espen, Espen Sandberg, who's here, and his partner, Joachim Ruining, they knew a lot about shooting. And they'd been shooting and, and uh, shooting with new technology. And when I work with an older directors, the, the um, digital technology is like, for me, it's fuzzy. You get other people to do it, you know. Uh, that's the look I want. You do it. And uh, you're not as involved as you would be in an anal analog sense with a set and looking at the set and looking at the props. So this is something that's got to be imagined by people. And um, the technology plus the skill and the way and the special effects company in Oslo and the skill of the directors and the technicians and where sharks have come and the combination of the very sharks that are used in the film made it very effective. Plus, you had the distraction of the most beautiful Nordic body. 
pulling that shark out There's of the water. That, yes. <laughs> and, it's a and, very and, distracting. And, and uh, you, you believe he's angry enough and strong enough to do it. So it's completely um, believable. And it's true. They were pulling sharks, more sharks, out of the water because on the Contiki, the level of the water went up and down. The sharks were at eye level on the waves, and you just put your hand into the wave and <laughs> pull the shark out. And they did that a lot. As a sport, as fun, they were terribly bored of this 101-day voyage. <laughs> and what, what better than pull a shark out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a bit of excitement, like bullfighting. You know, is, is this thing going to cut our leg off? And it's very, on the, on the voyage, on the, in the film, it was a palpable feel around me last night on the shark scenes. The people were absolutely, I mean, sharks are everybody's worst nightmare, you know. If uh, you're swimming in the sea, you know, or on the sea, and, and um, they're powerful creatures, king of the oceans, and you know when you see a shark fin, you're in, uh, without the cliche of Jaws dun, 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 music, you can get it, you can get an incredible effect from the fear. Yeah, the, the story is about so much else. It's it's really an, an epic voyage and, and about an explorer, a Norwegian explorer who's, who is um, seeking to prove that uh, Peruvians colonized Polynesia. But amidst sort of that drama, I think adding that element of adventure and integrating those kinds of thrilling shark scenes, it adds a level. You could definitely feel... Um, there was a, a palpable tension in the audience, and the crowd really responded to to that. Well, it was an amazing adventure. It was an adventure. This this character, Tor Heyerdahl, he was, um, and I met him three or four times. I went to visit him. He is, um, I think, one of Norway's greatest, if not his, their greatest hero. And um, he was an incredibly brave and confident man who took six men into, across the Pacific with no means of a, of a living if something went wrong. You know, there was no safety rescue, nothing. No, very little shipping across the Pacific. And um, they were going into the, literally the jewels of death. You know? So they, they, were, they were there as fodder for, for the animals in the ocean. And, and the tension of six men in a closed raft, close together, the tension of being with six people for 101 days floating, Becalmed, terrified, you know, and getting very probably fed up with the people you're around. It was, um, it was something that I thought this can really be an incredible movie. And, and um, we shot it was shot in the languages that it happened in. The, the, the Norwegians who went to um, he went to try and find the money in America, and uh, from National Geographic and various other people, various other places. So obviously, they Norwegians speak very good English. So they spoke English in the film. Then they went to Peru to, to start and build a raft and start the voyage. And with the Peruvians, they're speaking in English because it's a joint, it's a, it's a common language. Then obviously when Norwegians are on a raft together, they're not going to speak English together. They're going to speak Norwegian. You know. But subtitles are a sin for an audience, English-speaking audience. And it's very, very hard to promote your movie outside of a ghetto of cinemas. And uh, so the, there was a version that we shot, uh, like so the, well, six takes were shot in Norwegian and the, or the, the, the language, and the shots and the setup and the takes were perfected. And then thankfully, and uh, very nicely, because we raised some more money to do it, the next couple of takes were shot in English. So it wasn't like a dubbing job or a revoicing job. The same setup was shot. And uh, that is in, ready to be completed. And uh, of course, what was shown here was the true version of the film, which, as it would have happened in life, languages, but um, with a sort of hybrid um, idea of promoting this other version of the film, so that more people could enjoy it. You know, it's, um, it's a big frustration for me working with subtitle movies because um, I don't. People read text, but they can't read subtitles. <laughs> Well, that speaks to your your ability to mutate, to change, to adapt uh, to the industry, um, which uh, again is really extraordinary and a testament to to your long career. And I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions as well, so I'm sure there are many. Um, so we're going to open it up to a few. Do we have? Um... Yes. Um, Mr. Thomas, you use the. Uh, here we go. You used the phrase, read it, like it, which is great, but I assume in many cases it's read it, like it, but it could be better. 
and what's your attitude to working with the uh, writer and the director uh, when you see that there's some improvements that uh, would make the project more accessible to audiences? Well, it's an essential part of that. I never, I never answered Jacqueline's question about how much I like to be involved in the film. You know, I've been involved in the film as long, much as the filmmakers will let me. You know, I'm not a person who will impose too much um, on them because it's, um, I wouldn't want it myself as a filmmaker. And I've directed films and I, I wouldn't want somebody on my back because it's a very difficult job to do anyway. But the script is something I like to work on. I've got colleagues that I work with and we look at the script carefully and I've taken scripts which aren't too great and thought, well, I see something in this and we'll ameliorate it and try and work on it and get other writers to work at it and... and um, work very hard on that, you know, look, at, that's an area where I can work on the screenplay, you can work on the screenplay, because it also it's cheap to work on a script. Once you're in the shooting process, it's very difficult to change things, and you shoot things, so the script is the cheapest and easiest place to get the thing right, pre-edited, work on it, manipulate it, without being too punishing to those that collaborate with you, and maybe you, you get it right, maybe the script writer comes and it's really good, you know, or it's an auteur, like David, Grenenberg, who was writing and directing his films, or turd, I don't know what the word should be, whatever the right word at the moment is, um, um, filmmaker who's very, very involved in the writing and promotion of his films, personal filmmaker like him, it's just something that he's already written and edited the film, and it's only 90 pages long anyway, so that there's very, it's not much, it's very sparse anyway, so um, every case is different. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Thomas. I'd like to ask you, what is your take on 3D cinema? Yeah. I, was, I can't see 3D, you know. 20% of people can't see it because I've got squint, you know. And I have to really concentrate hard, put my eyes together to see 3D. Uh, but uh, you've got to have two perfect eyes, you know. And so apparently very few people can really see it perfectly, but I've shot films in 3D. And, uh, yeah, I didn't get more people to see the film. I'm not precious about it. Um, I don't, I mean, they've equipped a lot of cinemas in 3D now. Um, I think it can be distracting, probably not used well. Uh, an artist probably can use it to enhance his film. Um, I still think it's probably in its, um, is in moving forward in how it's going to be used. Certainly Vim Mendes, for example, who you have to admire as a great, one of the great cinema artists, he, like, he doesn't want to shoot a film in anything but 3D, and he sees life as 3D. So that is his take on it. And uh, other people be using it to get, you know, like a, some sort of terrible effect, which is making people complain to councils around the world that they're making their children sick. And um, I don't know exactly where it's going to sort of lie but it's not that expensive now. I mean, it, it was very expensive, but now that you know, Panasonic 3D camera, you can just buy a 3D camera, you know. So maybe, I don't know. I don't, um, certainly film is dead, dying, unfortunately, which is my favorite. But that is because I'm most used to film and I understand it more. And um, I, the imperfection of film is um, nice to look at. Uh, but now when you can't even process it, then it's over, isn't it? But the reality is bitten. And they make, it's going to be like vinyl records. It is like vinyl records now. You know, a few DJs play vinyl records. Hi. Um, first and foremost, of course, it's been amazing learning through you here these past 30 minutes. Um, quick question. Besides knowing, having an amazing script, um, what else would you say determine what, what do you work with? What's that one component that made you decide on all the projects, all the different projects that you've worked with? Well, I like working with friends. Um, and I like working with the same people again if I can. Because, you know, the whole initial phrase, getting to know you with a director, and then once you're on the second film, you know them, and they know you. Because um, the word producer engenders an enormous amount of suspicion. Um, yeah, it's true that you produce a very crude character with a cigar who doesn't know anything about anything. 
he only knows about greed and being, being vulgar. And um, that is a viewpoint which is traditional in uh, the, the caricature of a film producer with a cigar, you know. In fact, when I was an assistant editor, there was a producer we used to call the human ashtray because he used to have so much cigar ash on his black velvet jacket at the end of rushes. So, you know, I have seen them and I know they exist, but um, yeah. being a producer is a, you know, is a privileged job, especially in my place, because I can choose what I do. You know, I'm not making films for people. I'm making films first and foremost for myself and hopefully for others. And um, that's been, that's absolutely the opposite of what anybody will tell you. And it's absolute um, a no-no to have any taste of your own. <laughs> but that's what I recommend. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, hi, mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Aguil, thank you. Um, I just want to say, um, are you pressured by the market at all as you get projects? Because now it's much more pressure in the marketplace to pick what they want instead of what you want. And another question is, you really think that the idea of cinema is dying? Because uh, another friend of mine, who's an actor for many, many years, has said the same thing. So I'm, I'm like yeah. to hear from you. Thank you. Um, it's definitely dying, yeah. And um, it's mutating into something else, you know. But the cinema that you loved, um, I mean, you can't avoid your age, you know and it, life changes and you, you think about what you really loved, you know. And to tell you the truth, um, in fact, Jacqueline asked me, what recent films have you really loved, you know? And I have to tell you that there's a handful in the last decade that I could put up and say, that really changed my life, you know, that is something, wow. Few and far between, you know. Whereas I can think of films in the 70s, films out of the 30s, the 20s, the, I can tell you, I can reel them off to you. Major, major, life-enhancing, life-changing films, you know. And, um, but that's just because I'm my age. You know? And uh, somebody of 20 would tell you, what are you talking about? Um, this film, that film, something we don't even know about, has no significance for us. That's an important film for them, you know. Yeah, I can recognize Train Spotting as a really important, vibrant film, like I, re like I recognize The Sex Pistols, and in the UK, changing the face of music, I can see landmark films and sort of game changes along the way. Um, because you have the, the, the ability and the, and the privilege to have a, um, some, um, you, know, you can look at a whole enormous canon of work. Um, and the main problem with cinema is that if you love um, paintings, if you were a painter and a person writing about paintings, you would have to know everything about paintings because you couldn't even quote or criticize a painting. If you were a literary critic, you couldn't even touch literature unless you could quote theater critic, ballet critic. In film, is something that everybody possesses and everybody's an expert. They go and see some brilliant work. They've got no idea what it's about. It's a terrible film. They don't understand what's under them because you're, you're meant to entertain them, you see. So it's a very delicate balance of entertainment and profoundness and um, quality and uh, commerciality. And I suppose when I'm thinking about films, I'm using my hard drive of experience. And um, subconsciously, I'm assessing the script or I'm reading it. Can I find out? Do I like it? Can I find the money for that? Can I cast it? Um, so those are obviously in the decision-making process. I'm not agonizing over that. It's already there. You know, I read it. I'm doing it. And I'm very frustrating, obviously, to people I work with as well, because uh, this recent film I'm making, the film I'm going to start in October, I couldn't, even the people I work with didn't like it, you know. <laughs> so, but I still, I still um, bullied everybody and we're doing it. You know? <laughs> so, so. Uh, my question is, um, the saying is, uh, as a producer, you marry the director. Um, and working with first-time directors, um, how do you know that the director has something that is important for them to say and that, it's, that they actually have something to say? Yeah, it's difficult. And um, I've worked with first-time directors a few times. Um, 
it's quite difficult working with first time directors being very experienced yourself because you want to interfere and you don't and you don't want to interfere because you wouldn't want to be interfered with but um, for example Jonathan Glazer his first film we did um, I'd been shown by somebody working with me all his video clips and uh, fantastic stuff he'd been shooting commercials so when the script arrived I had already been told Jonathan Glazer is a ma magnificent artist and so I read that script Sexy Beast script, mm. which was a sort of something something was submitted. I didn't develop it, and uh, we changed the script a lot. But it was sent as it was, you know, sent roughly. That I already had the visualization of what the film could be because um, I married the um, filmmaker's work with the uh, screenplay, and that you know just to digress for a second. You see, when um, if you know about artists and paintings you can sort of marry a script to a painter and um, or a subject to a painter and you've sort of had some idea what would come out the other end you know so you think well you know i'm going to get dali to make this film or i'm going to get picasso or van gogh or david hockney whatever and you would say well, the producer which is your job i get what the finished thing is going to be something like that you know but um, that, is a, that is what a producer has to do, is needs to try and imagine what the film will be like. And uh, with a first-time director, it's more difficult to imagine that because you've not seen so much of his work. When you see a film, a, a, the directors often, you can, some directors, Terence Malick, for example, he's like a director, you can see his signature on his films. You can see his film. You know and uh, there's nobody else would have made Tree of Life. Um, that is signature film, you know? So uh, there are fewer, fewer and fewer people are allowed to do that, to sort of, that's a film by Nicholas Rogue, that's a film by but Marty Scorsese. Even Scorsese's films are more difficult to notice what they are today. You can look at his first maybe half dozen, dozen films, and you can know that's Marty Scorsese's film. But he's sort of, he's now gone a bit broader now and, um, you know, changed his sort of style a bit. You've talked a lot about fine art. Uh, do you have a favorite painter? I don't have a favorite anything. <laughs> I don't, you know. Um, it's very difficult to be favorite. And people always ask me, what's your favorite film? Who's your favorite director? What's your favorite painter? I like so many things, you know. I love Bonnard. I like... Um, Diego Rivera, I like. I like everything. I like all painters, you know. But I, but I, you know, I really enjoy looking at paintings and sitting in front of paintings and uh, not owning paintings. I don't want to own them. Um, I like um, watching painters work. Um, I like watching photographers, and I like photography. And as I think I didn't finish my but you know, producer, good producer, is very privileged because you're involved in literature, art, uh, design, uh, drama, uh, technology, and business, which is a very exciting thing. Um, hi, uh, Mr. Thomas, thank you for speaking with us today. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, my name's Eli, and I'm just wondering, when you're, doing, uh, when you're producing a film and you don't have a name actor, um, how do you go about creating a team that allows you to get the financing that you need to create that film? It's got to be very cheap. You know. <laughs> what can I tell you? you know, it's very hard promoting a film, independent film, without any film stars. You know, because you can promote the finished product because then people look at the film and say, enough people like this film. But um, that's a difficult, one of the difficult parts of setting up independent movies is getting the actors going through the wall of agents and managers mm -hmm. to get the actor to commit to your film without commitment or finance that you don't have, getting all the people together into some sort of ball that you can sell to people. It's very, very difficult, and I'm not underestimating it. I find it difficult still today. I mean, I'm always on the edge on films. Um, often films are completely... Um, I think I'm going to explode in setting them up, you know. 
and even wreck my business by having to guarantee what I can't afford and I'm very dangerous and felt that and I'm afraid that's the only way you know if you're going to be an independent if you're going to have a parent well you're just working with somebody else and they're going to be your parent and that's a very nice thing and I've never found a parent who's been wanted to have the recalcitrant child like me you know <laughs> so that I never managed to get there but I would like it and I've always been looking for that and I'm not un you know yeah, I can't underestimate how what a really difficult thing it is to produce I mean to to produce the goods. What's the producing film? It's producing the cash, basically. You know. With all of your your experience producing films, do you see? Are there any of the, any of the changes that you see sort of coming in cinema that you actually think are are good for um, the the process of for the process of filmmaking uh, for making art films? You know, the changes in technology and the changes in distribution streams. Do you think there's uh, there's hope that there are good well, I think there's, um, I'm not, I mean, even using the word art, it's worse than using the word liberal, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. He's a liberal. You know, it's an art movie. You know? It's like a terrible word, you know. And um, that's serious. I'm not joking, you know. A specialised film. This is a specialised film. Or this is a film that's going to be focused on a particular type of people. The word art is very dangerous in cinema. I don't know. It's not, I don't know. It's, it's something which is, uh, concerns me. Because they are an art. And um, it is an art. And I think that most people's lives from an early age has been affected by cinema as much as anything else in life. And uh, early visions are so crucial. But um, it's not it's the money side of the film business. The money it costs to make movies, it it, 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 it makes the it makes what the equilibrium or what the balance of um, the reality and realisms of making films uh, is to do with the risk of money that it costs to make a film and market films, which is the marketing side of it. We haven't even got there, and the cost of marketing, cost of marketing films has killed the art house, specialised house business, because the marketing costs are so enormous. And people can't afford to show the films. And uh, that's why so many films aren't distributed. So many great movies aren't distributed. I mean, there are many films that are shown here in Toronto which we packed out. People love them. Then they get distributed. They'll be shown at festivals. There's a new circuit starting in the world, which is the festival circuit, which films go around. I mean, a country will have not art house cinemas anymore, but our festivals, you know. So in England, maybe there are 30 film festivals or 50 film festivals. There are festivals all over... Canada, but they need films to put in their film festivals to get the paying guests. So now I think producers are thinking, well, the only income I'm going to get my film is from a film festival. You want my print? $5,000. Thank you very much. And so you show the film at 200 festivals and you get your million dollars back like that. Like that. So that's an, there's a change for you because people are going to see, use Toronto as an example, seeing these films en masse, queuing around the block not another time of year. So that's the time when you're going to make your cash, you know. And so a big film festival like Toronto or Cannes or Berlin, the producers are happy to let their films come here because they're going to get something back, which is the market and the profile. When you start showing in Canal or Barkerville or wherever, you know, Barkerville Film Festival or something like that, you want to get, and they are getting a lot of audience into that screen. And not only that, probably the council have paid for that, or the local people have paid for the thing. Then the poor film filmmaker who comes from Taiwan with his film, and it'll be fill up, but he won't see any money out of that, and nor do you see distribution. So that is a new way of of um, monetizing a film. So that's a good idea. That's true. That's that's a, and I think there are certain people now starting this festival distribution business and taking filmmakers' films and distributing, not distributing them to distributors, distributing them to festivals. Well, um, I want to sort of close by just saying, um, you know, it's, it's really been an honor and a privilege to speak with you this afternoon, so thank you, and uh, thank you for bringing your latest films yeah. to the Toronto Film Festival. Thank you very much.